Moon's story about Luisa Solano. Every Christmas when she was a little girl, she received a big package from her aunt. The package was always full of books. Luisa Solano loved the books, not only what was in them, but also the look and the smell of them. Oh, she thought, if only she could be surrounded by 10,000 books. And now she is. And now the people who write the words in the books come calling on her. We come across one other store like this in, in uh, my life, and that was a place called Turret Books in London. And that was a long time ago. It's out of business now. Poetry in this country is largely uh, uh, an art without honor. And uh, it's extraordinary to have a place where one can come and get the books one needs that sells uh, the books of poets. She's run the store making $50 a week and eating at friends' houses. And anyone who has that kind of determination really has a great love for what they're doing. Hello, Rafani and Lori. <laughs> she is Louisa Solano. Poets aren't inclined to unanimity, but Philip Levine, William Corbett, and David Brennan are one in their praises of the proprietor of the Grolier Bookshop in Cambridge, Massachusetts. It is the oldest poetry shop in the country, and although facts about poets are as hard to find as their out-of-print books, it is probably the only one dealing solely in the works of the group Aristophanes called the eager, meager servants of the muses. Yeah, it's the uh, Mississippi Faulkner County Press. Knocked down. Yep. Yeah, right. <laughs> Among the heavyweights who have visited the Grolier are Robert Frost, T.S. Eliot, and Marianne Moore. I just felt the poets deserved a store that represented their interests and their work. And no other place was willing to do it. And since I care about it, it was natural. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. The 10 years of Louisa Solano's ownership have been more important to art than to the IRS. Last year, her weekly take-home pay stayed largely in the path of penury. Between 100 and 150 a week. Now it's about 175. But basically, it's, you know, it's minimum. Every morning at 7, Louisa quits an East Cambridge apartment she shares with stray animals and sets out for her odd emporium. Louisa Solano deals with poetry in its formal fashion on the printed page, but she seems to hear its resonances in much of the world around her. When people find out what I do for a living, a lot of people will tell me, you know, I like poetry, but I don't show it to my friends. It uh, happens all the time. I deal with poets all the time. I, find, I think they're average people. They can be any kind, any type, any nationality, be housewives, be professors, be mechanics, be taxi cab drivers, be waitresses. It doesn't matter. The Grolier Bookshop has survived at the edge of Harvard Square for nearly 60 years without selling volumes on how to grow thin, rich, or happy. Louisa Solano keeps it going on the sale of visions, the visions of poets. I walked into the store when I was 15, started helping the original owner, Gordon Canny, on Saturdays and after school, uh, supported myself at other jobs, and always came back to help him on weekends. When he died in 73, and I was unemployed, and without any money whatsoever. Ten of his customers got together, got a bank loan for me, and I got the store. When Gordon died, 
I had to collect the bills that his dear friends owed him. Only one paid up out of about 60 people. Really? People wrote, wrote me letters saying I offended his memory because... Oh, why? Yeah. <laughs> That's a good line. <laughs> But he did run in more as a club for his cronies, all who happened to be literary people, a number of whom were poets. I'll read a couple of these. He has the only poem I've ever known about writing, about reading poetry aloud. Uh, my poems resembled the bread of Egypt. One night passes over it and you can't eat it anymore. Robert Bly, a frequent Grolier visitor, autographed some of his books and read aloud from one. Where a poem belongs is here, in the warmth of the chest. Out in the world, it dies a cold. You've seen a fish, put him on dry land. He quivers for a few minutes, and then he's still. In a bakery, one is impelled to bite on a bun. But in a poetry bookshop, one feels the need to burst forth. This burst is from Edna Millay. I drank at every vine, the last was like the first. I came upon no wine so wonderful as thirst. I gnawed at every root. I ate of every plant. I came upon no fruit so wonderful as want. Feed the grape and bean to the vintner and monger. I will lie down lean with my thirst and my hunger. I think reading poetry it's like anything else. The more you do, the more adept in it you become. The more Among Louisa's favorite books is A. E. Hausman's A Shropshire Lad. When I was one and twenty, I heard a wise man say, Give crowns and pounds and guineas, but not your heart away. Give pearls away and rubies, but keep your fancy free. But I was one and twenty, no use to talk to me. When I was one and twenty, I heard him say again, the heart out of the bosom was never given in vain. Tis paid with sighs of plenty and sold for endless rue. And I am two and twenty, and ah, tis true, tis true. Do I write poetry? Yeah. Yes, I do. And I don't consider it very good. So I don't try to publish it. And I certainly would never, well, I've shown it to a few friends, but not very many. But I find the store. I find talking about poetry almost as good as writing it sometimes. Looking down from the walls which on occasion sheltered them are William Carlos Williams, Ezra Pound, and Robert Lowell. Perhaps John Keats spoke for all the poets when he said, a thing of beauty is a joy forever. Its loveliness increases. It will never pass into nothingness, but still will keep a bower quiet for us and a sleep full of sweet dreams and health and quiet breathing. <laughs> 